1959. Here at La Vida Baseball, we take pride in talking about the journey, the Latino journey. Celebrate. It's English preferred, but we celebrate the Latino journey. Wonderful. And one of the greatest journeys in baseball history is yours. 1959 with the Dodgers, but before that, you came here. Yeah. And how many baseball games? I know the answer, but tell Tell our followers, how many baseball games had you seen before you got to the United States? Well, I came to this country in 1955. I arrived here June 24, 1955, while in Irie, the same day that Sandy Koufax pitched his first game in the Major Leagues, June 24, 1955, I arrived into Los Angeles. Before coming to this country, I never, never, never saw a baseball game in my life because I come from Quito, Ecuador. In Quito, we don't play baseball. In Guayaquil, they play some baseball. Uh, but in Quito, nothing. So before coming to this country, uh, I was a soccer fan, boxing fan, but no baseball, because in Quito, we don't know baseball. I never saw uh, a baseball, a bat, a meat, never, never, until I came to this country. I arrived here in, in June 1955. So. Uh, I started working at KWKW by the end of, uh, of uh, 1955 and uh, I was always a very sports-minded people. Uh, I used to follow soccer, used to follow boxing, a little bit of basketball. But then in, uh, in October 1955, I remember vividly seeing so many people around TV sets and around radio receivers in Los Angeles following something. It was the World Series. And I asked around, said, what, what's that? So much, so many people watching this and, and listening to these games. And they said, it's baseball. It's the World Series in New York between the Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers. So I became aware of baseball. So I decided to go to the Gilmore Field and the Wrigley Field in Los Angeles because we had two AAA teams in Los Angeles, the Hollywood Stars and the Los Angeles Angels. And the Hollywood Stars used to play at the Gilmore Field and the, and the Angels used to play at, at the all now disappeared Wrigley Field. The first Wrigley Field? The Wrigley Field. Mr. Wrigley built that uh, exactly like the Wrigley Field here, a smaller, a smaller size. So I started going there on weekends because I, I was interested in baseball. So, but I never thought that uh, that's eventually, someday, I will be doing a baseball game. Uh, I have never saw baseball games, so I started going to on, on weekends for three years until the Dodgers came to the West Coast in 1958. And uh, I never applied for the job. Uh, I never filled an application for the job. I was the news and sports director of KWKW in those days. And, uh, and the radio station got the rights to do the games in Spanish. So one day, Mr. William Beaton, who was the owner of KWKW, called all the employees to his office to let us know that he has got the Dodgers. So he told us, I, I have signed a contract with the Dodgers to broadcast the games in Spanish, and I need two announcers, he said. So uh, one of the employees, Alex Prada, who used to do news there on the station, said, I know someone who knows baseball. He's a professional. Uh, his name is Rene Cardenas. So Mr. Beaton said, please ask Rene to come and meet me and let's, let's have a, uh, uh, an audition with him. Then looking at me, he said, I want you to be the next one, along with Rene. And I was shocked. And I said, Mr. Beaton, I'm sorry. Now I know some baseball because I have been going on weekends to watch the games, the AAA games, uh, for two years, almost three years. But I don't know the game. Uh, as much as to be in front of a microphone. He said, I'm sorry. But he liked me very much. I was very young. I was 22 years old. And he said, Jaime, there's a future for you. You have been doing boxing very well. I know you You have the, the talent to, to, do, to do sports. So he said, I'm going to give you a year. Prepare yourself. I want you there next year. So that first year, 58, I was listening to every single game on radio. Television wasn't much help because in those years, in those days, there was only one game a week on television. It was Saturday, uh, so television is nothing. But I started reading every book, every magazine about baseball. 
So by 1959, I was ready to start, and I started with René Cárdenas, uh, doing a couple of innings first, very little by little, until René left for Houston in 1962, and uh, uh, Fat Garcia came. Uh, René recommended him from Nicaragua, a great, great play-by-play -play guy, great, uh, very great. Jose, I learned more from Jose than René, because René was, I was with him only, only three years. So, Father Garcia came on 1962, he passed away in 1972, so I became number one in 1973. And uh, I have been with the Dodgers for 61 years. And I think it's very important for people to know, we talk about, you know, Jim Crow in the South and everything that ballplayers have gone through. It wasn't always easy, right? When you finally traveled, some of the, you weren't calling, and Vince Scully spoke on your behalf. Yes. Can you share that experience with us of where you were put at some of the stadiums? Yes, at, at the beginning it was, I, at the beginning we didn't travel with the team. For about uh, six years, I think it was 1965, um, when we started traveling with the, with the Lashes. First we went to San Francisco only. And I remember one time Vince says, Jaime, where are you located? I said, I am over there. I said, at the corner of, of left field? I said, yes, that's the only place that is available. So he said, you know, he said, well, we are here behind home plate, and Jaime is in left field, why there, way down there. But someday, he said, someday, he will be here next to me. And uh, well, it was very nice for him to say that. He was very special with me, and uh, uh, we became very, very close friends, and he has been my mentor, my teacher, my idol, my friend, everything. I, mean, uh, I don't have enough words, enough words to, to really express myself the way that I feel towards him. He has been fantastic. And, and, uh, but we have problems at the beginning. Uh, until, well, late about, I will say about 10 years ago, we went to Minnesota. And uh, when I arrived at the ballpark, my engineer, my Noto said, Jaime, you are not going to like um, uh, about the, the place where, where we are going to be. I said, what do you mean? I said, you know, we are going, they put us behind right field. Behind, behind right field, yeah. So I went there, and I couldn't see the right fielder, and I couldn't see the center fielder. And we were behind about 20 feet behind the, 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 the fence. And this by this time, you had already won the Ford Frick Award, been yes. honored as one of the greatest baseball. In yes, so I so I, I said, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's impossible. And I said, why don't you put the English there? And let's stay here and behind home plate. Why don't you put them over there so they can see who, what it is? So, but I went, through the proper channels. I didn't complain to them directly, I complained to the Dodgers. I called the Dodgers and said, look, uh, they are treating us like peons here, and, uh, and uh, I am very, very unhappy. Do something. So the Dodgers called the, the, the twins. Next thing, the GM comes to me. I said, Mr. Harin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I would like to give you my box, but I have several guests tonight, so in, it's impossible. What about tomorrow? And I said, never mind, never mind. Okay, so then the owner comes, and I said, Mr. Harin, I hear what's going on. Please, use my box. Do the game for my box. And I said, thank you very much, but we already set up there, so we're going to do the game from there tonight. But tomorrow, I will be, I will be doing the game from your box. So that shows that, you know, it, it, is, it, it, it was, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And the thing is that if there's no space, I said, why don't you put the English there? I have probably a larger audience than the English. And, uh, but it was at the beginning, it was difficult. It used to put that way there, uh, especially on, on postseason, it was tough. It was tough because uh, I understand, you know, there's not, not enough boots in the, in the world park. But um, they were always, they, they tried to treat us as a second. Then I call, I call, uh, um, I call Manolo, Manolo Mota and I call Eduardo Ortega 
And I said, you come quite often here to Minnesota. Where, where, are, where do you do the games? From where? They said, oh, they put us behind the right field. I said, and do you, do you accept that? And they said, what can we do? I said, well, I, 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 I told them that I was very happy. And so they said, but he said, they said, but remember, we are not a Hall of Famer like you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what I, I appreciate, that you, you help everybody, you speak up. And, you know, Dillard Hernandez, columnist at the LA Times, and I, at one point, we were the only two Latino sports columnists at major American newspapers. Mm -hmm. And we both credit our, our success. I, I'm not here if not for Don Jaime. And, but more importantly, the generations, I go to Dodger Stadium, I'm taking my daughter this week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She was will see all these beautiful brown faces throughout the stadium. And most of it is because you taught our parents, our grandparents. You and I have discussed many of these topics, but I think it's important to discuss here. How is your daily life at the ballpark when you're at Dodger Stadium with the grandparents and the well, parents? Well, I am so fortunate to have been with the Dodgers doing what I love to do for 61 years. I never thought that, that my longevity would be something like that. I thought that probably I would be doing baseball for six, eight years and would then move to something else. But I fall in love with the baseball. I fall in love. I love baseball. But what really touches me very, very deeply, uh, and really the thing that really uh, pleases me the most, is when I am going to the supermarket or going to a restaurant, Many people stop me and say, Mr. Harin, my grandfather used to hear you. My mom fell in love with the baseball thanks to your voice. My father used to uh, listen to you every, every single day. And we love the game because of you. That really touches me very, very deeply. That's the best thing that I, c I could hear, to see that, uh, that I have been able to, to preach the the, the game, this beautiful game all around the world. And now, thanks to the new technology, I, I get uh, messages from China, from Argentina. We, I have great followers from Argentina. Uh, there's a fellow by the name uh, Santiago Santini that I know him, but we have become so, so, so good friends because he remember that the games over there started at 11 o'clock at night when we were playing in Los Angeles. And so he stays until three or four o'clock in the morning listening to us. Wow. And he, he reports to me the games and everything. And then in, from Buenos Aires, I received so many uh, tweeters and, and some, some from parts of the world that I never, never, never reached before. And so it, it pleases me so much. It's, it's fantastic. It is, it's great. In, in I think in 1981, I was just a kid, and before we go, before I go there, I also have to point out my parents. The biggest highlight when I started coming to Gordy Burrell would take me, mm -hmm. Beach, legendary Dodger writer. I was an intern in '94, and he introduced me to Don Jaime. And every time I would come back later when I started my career, you always made a point to ask about my parents. Oh, Como yeah. están tus papas? Oh, yeah, and it was the biggest highlight for my parents. When I would say, Apa, I'd call my dad, like I'd get, you know, I'd get home. This was before cell phones. Right, so right. That you know, <laughs> and and, and it, it meant so much to my dad that you would ask for him. Yeah. And Because it is a family member. And then I tell this story about, uh, we took a picture in 2002, two th in like 2004 or five with my daughter. Oh, yeah. And for, remember Fernando, you, yes, Pepe, yes, and you guys yes. and me. And I'm holding my daughter. And for many years, she... She asked about Jaime, Fernando Valenzuela once. And I said, he's the man that's in the picture with you. And then she goes, oh, with Jaime Harin? I thought that was family. <laughs> I said, well, yes, it's family. Well, Jaime Harin is family too. Yeah. yeah. So. But speaking of Fernando, yeah. that's, th that's when also you, you almost became a crossover, right? Because yes, that's when the American fans first got to see yeah. you. How was uh, that experience? Well. I, until 1950, I, until 1981, I was very well known strictly in Southern California, strictly in Los Angeles, because of my work at KWKW since 1955, 
and they have done so many special things for the community. So I was very well known, but only in Los Angeles. When Fernando came on, I had to be with him everywhere, even at the White House in Washington. And uh, that, that, uh, that put, put me in, in, a, in a different pedestal. And uh, then in New York, in Chicago, in Washington, Miami, uh, St. Louis, they knew who Jaime Harvin was. And he was able to be with Fernando as his uh, interpreter for two, almost three years. And I was looking everywhere. And as, uh, as you know, and many people know, uh, 1981 was a very super, super year, a very special year. I don't think that I will see you again another another year like 1981 because of Fernando, and uh, and uh, because of that, I, I they knew me about uh, they knew about me in every every part of the country, and that was a great experience. Uh, I thank Fernando for that, and uh, and um, uh, what he did for baseball was amazing, and I don't think that uh, any single ball player. Will, will be able to do as much as Fernando did for baseball because he created so many, so many new baseball followers, especially among females. It was unbelievable, 1981, how people reacted to Louis Kidd, you know, 19 years old, who came from Mexico, a little bit chubby, long hair, uh, Indian, Indian uh, uh, features, uh, and he took the, 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 the baseball world by, by a storm. He did what uh, nobody else would be able to do in favor of baseball. Fernando should be in the Hall of Fame because of that. I I agree with you. How was it? When did you learn English? Because you translated for him, and well, uh, when I came to this country, I worked for a radio station for here you know, four years, HCJB in Quito. That was a radio station owned by the Protestant Churches of the United States. It's a cultural station in Quito. With a, with a transmitter of uh, 750,000 watts. It's an unav uh, available at radio station. We were 80 announcers there, and most of the technical staff were, were Americans. So I heard English every single day. When I came to this country, and also I took English for six years at, at college, when I came to this country, I thought that I knew English, but when I, arrived, uh, when I arrived here, I was lost, believe me. I couldn't understand English. So I, right away, I went to a Cambria, Cambria English school in Los Angeles to take English because you have to speak the language here in this country. And, and, and uh, after Fernando, uh, the thing is that uh, after Fernando, uh, the English, uh, the Spanish classes at the UCLA and the USC and some other universities around Los Angeles, they invited me to speak to them because they were anxious to speak the language. So uh, it was fantastic. Because I think that everybody should be bilingual in this country, or trilingual if it's possible. Bilingual at least. They don't know how much it means to a person to speak two languages. It is unbelievable. And being in Southern California, Spanish of course, or any other language, if you speak Japanese or Chinese or Russian or whatever, you will have uh, great opportunities in later in life. Everybody should speak two languages. Everybody, that's an asset. And uh, and uh, I try to to learn. You know, I have been in this country so many years. I should speak English perfectly. But my problem is that I used to speak Spanish at home all day long because I wanted my children to be bilingual. And, and then I speak Spanish during the day at the radio station where I used to work and doing the, doing the dashes. So it was tough for me. To, to master the English language because I didn't have chance to, 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 to speak English. But I tried to, and I still had problems with the language. Uh, the, what really bothers me is the fact that, you know, I command my, my own language very well. And I feel so frustrated that I can't do the same thing with the, with the English language. Well, you do, you do a great job. And you mentioned your family. It's been a difficult period. Our uh, condolences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For your dear wife, 59 uh, years? Uh, well, um, I have been blessed in this country, really, really. Um, this country has been so good to me because since the first day that I arrived in this country, I have never been without a job for one single day. I have wow. never lost a uh, sleep for half an hour thinking, 
what I, what's going to happen um, tomorrow if I lose the job. I have always had two, three, and four jobs at the same time. The radio station, the dashes, uh, TV, I worked for Telemundo for uh, eight years as a sports director of Channel 52 in Los Angeles, and I used to do commercials for Seals. I was a spokesman for Seals for 20 years. I was the spokesperson for Chevrolet for 25 years, and I have been with Los Defensores uh, for 32 years. So I have been blessed in this country, but uh, I have had two, two tragic uh, things. First, in 1988, 30 years ago, when we lost our son, the middle of my three sons, Jimmy, unexpectedly, because of aneurysm in the brain, he collapsed one day, and he, he, when he got to UCLA, he was already dead. So that was a, a very, very tough blow to my wife and to myself. Then, a month ago, I lost my wife. She passed away after 65 years of marriage with me. And this has been very, very difficult. And I know, I, I, and I know, we talked in October, mm -hmm. and you, you, the love that you had. We talked about the love and your devoted sons, and um, and I, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to let this show go without expressing my condolences because you, you are family. Thank you very and much. And when you're hurting, you. we all are hurting. Thank you very much. And we at La Vida, we. We, yeah. we cherish you and your family, and I, I know it's difficult. It has been very, very difficult, very tough. We were in the spring training, and uh, we were in Phoenix. Uh, I have a, a, a very modest home that I bought there uh, eight years ago. And so we were there, and I didn't have a game to do for 12 days. So I told Jorge, my son, who works with me, that's the greatest blessing that I have received, to have him work with me. And uh, I told Jorge and his wife, Maggie, and my wife, no, we don't have a game to do for 12 days. Let's go someplace. So I said, let's go. And my wife said, yeah, let's go to Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's a beautiful city. We were there 10 years ago, and she fell in love with the city because of the art and everything. It's a beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous city, Santa Fe. So she said, let's go there. And I said, fine, but you know, it's too far. It's about nine hours driving. So why don't we go and spend the first night in, uh, in uh, Fort Staff and Flagstaff? And then we will continue the following day. So we went to Flagstaff. We stayed there in a beautiful, beautiful hotel. We had the lunch there, came back to the lobby of the hotel. My wife went shopping in those little stores at the, at the, at the hotel. Then we went down for dinner. And my wife was feeling fine. She had a, a heart history. She had a, a heart attack about 12 years ago, but she was f doing fine, doing fine. Uh, she has been, she was fighting um, uh, the diabetes, but she had diabetes under control. Everything was was fine. So at the hotel, we went down for for dinner at the restaurant in the hotel. So uh, we we were having dinner, and um, and she didn't have much appetite. appetite. And, but she ordered a, a, a dessert with a ice cream and, and pastries and things like that, and she shared with the, with the four of us. And she said, no, no, it's for all of us. After dinner, we went up to the room, and she had to, to climb about eight or ten steps. But when she climbed up there, she said, I was, I, I'm so tired, I can I can take one more step. And I said, the room is here, let's go to the room. So I went to the room, she, I said, lay down, lay down. She lay down, she was okay. It was around 11 o'clock at night. And she lay down, and uh, for about two hours, she was there, then she said, no, I, my, my, my back's hurting, I think it's the bed. Uh, I think it's the bed. Let's move to a, to a chair. We had a very nice, very comfortable chair there. So she moved to the chair and wrapped her legs with a, with a blanket. So for a couple hours, she was watching TV, talking with me, everything. Then she said, I am sleepy now. Let's move to the bed. So help her to go to bed. Then suddenly she wake me up at 5.30 in the morning and she said, Jaime, I, I feel strange. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't feel well. So I called Jorge right away to the room and said, Jorge, come to the room. My, my blanket is not feeling well. So Jorge came in. So then I noticed that she was, she was very uncomfortable. I said, Jorge, call the paramedics, please. Call the paramedics. 
So we call the paramedics. The instant that the paramedics arrived to the room, she 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 lost consciousness. And we, we start shaking her, Jaime, don't leave us, don't leave us, please, 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 wake up, wake up, wake up. And the, the, the paramedics took over. They worked for about 45 minutes trying to, they have so much equipment now. And, and, and then they said, no, let's go to the hospital. When we were leaving the, the room, one of the paramedics said, Jaime, she's in a very critical condition, but she's still alive. So we went to the hospital, we, we rode the, the, I rode the, the ambulance with them. So we got to the hospital, and in about less than 10 minutes, a doctor came out. I said, he, and he said, who is the husband? I said, yeah, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I'm sorry, your wife's gone. It was 8.30 in the morning. And uh, I said, are you sure? Are you sure? He said, yeah, she is dead. She's gone. So I couldn't believe it. But uh, the only good thing is that she didn't suffer at all. No pain or nothing. She just went away. And uh, she just went ahead of us. <laughs> and you, you devoted father, devoted husband, and you, you spent this, this career with her. I know she had a lot of pride in, in yeah, what she, you did. She, you you know, could she see it when, they, when you were, I'll tell you, um, you, you, you made the ring of honor. Mm -hmm. And I saw the pictures on Facebook. Yeah. You could see the pride she had in you. Uh, she was very, very special. You know, we were married 65 years. We got married in 1953. And she never, never complained about me being away so much from home because I'm not only doing baseball, but because of doing boxing, I used to be away from home a lot. She never, never complained. But at the same time, she was very reserved. She was very reserved. I had to beg her to come with me to functions that I was uh, going to be honored. She felt uncomfortable there, but she w she she was very very proud of, of me. She was always behind me, always helping me. She took care of the kids. She was a great great mother. She was a great wife, and uh, and she was a blessing really a blessing. And uh, it's tough to accept the uh, reality, but uh, uh, Jose on Facebook says, "I'm so sorry for your loss. I can't imagine. May God continue to be with you. We love you. Thank God for our children. They are a blessing." Um, and then Rebecca on Facebook also said, uh, "She heard the voice and she said it's Jaime." And she <laughs> she said, "I love the voice." Um, and then uh, Francisco Romero says, "Saludos, Don Jaime. Una inspiración. Un abrazo." Thank and you. then uh, Jesus Valdez on Facebook says, Jaime, uh, tengo una pregunta. ¿Cómo puedes hacer un, una, un cronista como de béisbol como usted? Yo quiero ser un uh, cronista como usted en el futuro y amo el béisbol. Well, if you want to become a, 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 a radio announcer or, or a writer, you have to be sure that you love what we are going to do. If you love baseball, you have to move, love more. And then you have to, to sacrifice a lot. Then you have to really, really put 110% in what you are going to be doing. Dedicate yourself completely and prepare yourself. You have to go to school, you have to, to study, you have to learn not only about baseball, because when you are doing a baseball game on radio or on TV, you will have lots of time to fill and you will have the opportunity to talk about many, many interesting things related to baseball or not necessarily related to baseball. So you have to go to school, prepare yourself. And if you get uh, the opportunity to do that, then you have to do your homework. You have to work a lot because otherwise uh, you won't sound right. Uh, I have been able to do baseball and boxing, two different things completely. In boxing, you don't have time for for commentary, for things like that. You you describe blow by blow the fight, that's it. In baseball, it's the opposite. You have plenty of time to feel, especially if you are doing radio. That's what I said. If, if you are doing radio, you have to be there. You have to be in the theater of the action, so you can describe everything. Uh, doing radio is, to me, um, uh, probably a little bit more difficult. At the same time, 
requi requires more of you because you have to describe what you are saying and try to do what your eyes are captain, not your heart. Uh, because otherwise you will be um, one-sided, uh, you will be not fair to, to some others, and so it is very important to do your homework. I used to dedicate up to four hours a day before a game. Now, thanks to the technology, we don't need that much time. Years ago, I had to beg for a magazine, for a newspaper. The, soonest, uh, the first thing that I will do when I, uh, when I will arrive into a city is to look for newspapers uh, in order to prepare my broadcast. Nowadays, it's, it's so easy now. You go into the internet and, and you have everything there to, mm -hmm. to help you do a, a decent job on, on, on the microphone. So it is very important you do your homework, prepare yourself, and be ready to, to many, many unexpected things while you are on the microphone. You remember Vince Scully and you <coughs> on similar planes, but the thrill in Manila you called. Yeah. Howard Cosell and you. Yes. Uh, well, it was a great, a great experience for me because, you know, it was totally an strange spot for, uh, for me to be in the Philippines. And then it was, the weather was so bad, it was raining all the time, it was so hot, so humid, and the fight was at 10 o'clock in the morning, and, and to see Muhammad Ali uh, being, being acclaimed there as the king of the kings there, he used to walk on the streets followed by hundreds of people, it was, it was, a, it was a circus, it was unbelievable, and the fight itself was something that I will never, never see again, the best fight both both guys went to the hospital. Uh, Lee thought that he had lost the fight because he was going to stop. But then, uh, 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 um, For, was it Foreman? Uh, no, no, it was uh, no, no, what's the name? Fraser. 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 It was Fraser who anticipated too much and he quit without knowing that Mohammed was going to quit right away. If he had waited. Ten more seconds, he would have won the fight. Wow. It was unbelievable. I have had, you know, um, I have been blessed to do things that, uh, uh, that uh, very, very unique things. You know, when the first case of a, of a airplane hijack, it was a fellow by the name Ricardo Chavez Ortiz who who uh, commanded a uh, uh, Frontier uh, Airlines flight in, uh, in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, with 56 passengers. And he, he took the plane to Los Angeles, and the FBI called me and said, uh, you know what, this guy who's, who hijacked the planes is asking for you to meet with you in order to release the passengers. Oh my. So for me, so the helicopter, the, the FBI, sent me a helicopter to, to KWKW in Pasadena to pick me up to take me to the airport uh, in order to, to, to face the Ricardo Chavez Ortiz so he can release the passengers. And uh, then being at the White House, you know, with Fernando, that was a thing that I will never forget. Um, there was this screen. Ronald Reagan? Uh, Ronald, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the president and, and George Bush was, was the vice president. You know, climbed the stairs to the to the dining room of the White House. And we had the, the the Marine Corps band playing the most beautiful arrangements of Mexican songs, Cielito Lindo, very well known songs, and that shook me up so much. You know, listen, those beautiful arrangements of uh, Mexican uh, music, uh, going climbing the stairs to the to the dining room. Then in the dining room after lunch to see the most powerful men in line waiting for an autograph from, from this kid from Mexico, 19 years old, Fernando Valenzuela. It was Reagan, it was Bush, it was Alexander Haig, Secretary of State, it was Wayne Berger, Secretary of the Defense, it was the Attorney General, all of them in line waiting for this kid to <laughs> sign a baseball. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. You, um I know you have a busy schedule, and you you promised thirty minutes. It's almost twelve forty. I don't know what's your schedule like. Do you need to leave? I have to leave. I know you have to leave. Uh, 
one final quest. Do you have a final quest, and then we'll let you go. I really apologize. Okay. I no, 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 that's fine. Two two quick comments. Yes. Um, so, mi Mr. Harin sharing uh, words of wisdom, advice for the ages, no matter what your profession. And Jose says, I can feel the love you had for your wife in your voice. Que Dios te bendiga. Gracias. Thank you. And Thank then you. Jose from uh, Las Vegas said saludos de Las Vegas. Oh, gracias. Gracias. Uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, I am glad to be here. It is a precious time to be sharing my, my experiences with you. I wish I had more time to go on, uh, but uh, you know, I have to be at the hotel uh, at exactly, one o'clock. Exactly. No, so thank you very much. I'll ask but, uh, one last question. Yes. Out of all your awards, Ford Frick, Reed, Ring of Honor Dodgers, which is your favorite? Well, uh, the one that really uh, got me was the Ring of Honor because the, the, the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, I was the fourth guy there. It was Dan Sutton, and I was the third one. Dan Sutton, Robbie Dobby, and myself. I was the third one, and it was so open, so big. But the Ring of Honor in Dodger Stadium really hit me very, very, very deeply because I was the only one. Being Vince honored Kelly, that day. Honored there. Vince Kelly came on to speak with me and to take me to the corner of left field where the microphone is. And really, and my wife was there, all my family were there, so it was really, really, so I would have to put the Ring of Honor then, then the Hall of Fame, then the, the decoration, the, the, the medal that I have from the government of Ecuador, that 1992, uh, the President Rodrigo Borja gave me the highest medal that I can give to a non-military uh, personnel, so I, I, I got the recognition from my own country, and what else can I ask? I have really overwhelmed by, by, and the love of the people, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, when I take my break in the fourth and fifth innings at Ayo Stadium, I walk around the ballpark and really hits me the fact that many times I heard more Spanish than English there. And before, you know, the, the Spanish speaking people, the Latinos were only in the bleachers in left field and the right field now. I see everywhere, everywhere, even in the most expensive seats, everybody is speaking Spanish. That really fills me a lot and it feels so great. And in a way I said probably I part I I I did a little little thing in that regard. You did a lot because I know because I grew up listening to you. Muchas gracias. Okay. I'll end it with muchas gracias. Yeah. I know muchas gracias. We're gonna try to get you an Uber to get you back. Thank you very, very un much. Placer, queridos amigos, ha sido un enorme gusto para mí estar con ustedes, compartir estos minutos en nuestro eh, en inglés, pero ahora quiero dirigirme a ustedes en el idioma que me llevó a Cooperstown, que me llevó al Jardín de la Fama, que me llevó al Ruin Fanner español. Muy orgulloso de, de mi idioma, muy orgulloso de estar con ustedes. Eh, les felicito por seguir el béisbol, que es un deporte prístino, un deporte limpio, un deporte maravilloso que les recomiendo para todos los niños. Un placer estar con ustedes. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. A ustedes. Muchísimas okay. gracias. Thank you. I took a selfie. There we go. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much.